Wonderful. Thank you, Scott. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to, um, well, for one, my last panel of Dragon Con, um, which is a little bit of a bittersweet thing, but um, the con goes on after this. Uh, my name is Amy Stepanovich. I am the Vice President of U.S. Policy at the Future of Privacy Forum. Um, in just a second, I am going to let my um, esteemed panelist um, to my right introduce himself. Um, but before that, I want to actually do some level setting. So the name of this panel is the Fight to Save the Affordable Connectivity Program, or ACP. Um, we'll probably use the, the acronym ACP quite a lot because there's a lot of syllables in the full name. Um, and I'm wondering, um, before we start talking, how many of you are already familiar with the Affordable Connectivity Program? A little bit. Have any of you actually used the ACP? Awesome. Yeah, okay, that's great. That means um, we will start at square one for those of you who are not familiar at all with it, um, but some of you are going to maybe be able to ask a few more advanced questions. Um, there are not, um, this is not a packed room, which means we can actually interact with those of you who are here quite a bit. Um, if you have a question, please come up to the mic in the middle because that way we can capture it on the video that is being recorded. Um, but feel free, we can have some back and forths as we go through the panel and don't feel like you have to wait um, for the two of us to stop talking in order to line up to ask a question because that might never stop. We're both from DC and we are trained to, to not stop moving our mouths. Um, so, so just come up and, and we'll halt for you. Um, so Chris, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell, tell us a little bit about what work you do and public knowledge, maybe? Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Chris Lewis. I'm the President and CEO of Public Knowledge. Uh, we are a Washington, D.C. Uh, nonprofit tech policy shop, uh, digital rights consumer organization, uh, where we work to promote free expression online and an open internet and affordable access to communication tools and creative works, which is word for word our mission. That means we cover a broad base of tech policy stuff. Um, one of which, like a third of the work, is on broadband policy, uh, including the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, so excited to be here and talk about it. Awesome. Um, I'm finally realizing the first and maybe only advantage I have over you is that I'm closer to the microphone, so I don't have to lean down. Do I need to there. lean? I think you might need to. Okay. <laughs> I think or I could <laughs> just I could just hold the microphone. Yeah. Um, so our, our first question for the conversation is if you can tell us a little bit about the ACP, um, how it was created, and what it was meant to accomplish. Okay. Uh, so for those of you who hadn't heard of the ACP, the uh, ACP was created in 2021. It was, and I say it was because it recently ended, which we'll talk about, but uh, it was uh, a $14 billion uh, fund to provide subsidies for folks who cannot afford broadband. Uh, and uh, it, it and its precursor uh, program, the, it was actually preceded by uh, almost a year uh, by a program called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, but those two were the first ever uh, low-income subsidy for people uh, to get broadband. Um, as you can guess, uh, 2021, we were still in the throes of the pandemic. And after um, after like two decades of activists like us at Public Knowledge and others talking about their the fact that there's a digital divide, uh, it really hit home with some folks during the pandemic. And people started to say, okay, what do we need to do now that everyone is in their homes uh, and, and working or going to school from their homes, what can we do to try to make sure that we don't have a digital divide? And uh, the number one reason when you look at polling uh, from uh, Pew researchers and others, the number one reason why people don't have broadband uh, of the three like major reasons uh, is affordability. And so when uh, Congress decided to pass uh, the CARES Act, that was the like um, uh, COVID emergency package, uh, they created the EBB, the Emergency Broadband Benefit. It was a $50 uh, subsidy for low-income folks. And uh, you basically qualified for it if you were 200% uh, uh, of, uh, of the poverty rate or if you qualified for other low-income programs. So, uh, you know, SNAP, 
um, old uh, telecom subsidies like Lifeline, even uh, young people who are uh, who were uh, currently using um, uh, Pell Grants could qualify. And I've actually met uh, people who were in college trying to finish their degree uh, were using Pell Grants. Uh, and instead of making them go out and get a job to support themselves while they go through college and need broadband to study, uh, how about we just give them the subsidy? So it was really first of its kind, very important. And then at the end of 2021, uh, Congress decided to try to make what we hoped would become a model for a permanent program, not an emergency COVID program. That was the ACP. And they added it on and modified and tried to tweak and fix uh, issues that they saw with the EVB. It was basically an extension of the program. It's administered by, or it was administered by the Federal Communications Commission. And, um, uh, it, oh, I'm sorry, and, and the ACP, when it was created, they dropped it down from a $50 subsidy to a $30 subsidy. Uh, but they were able to get just about every major large broadband provider to uh, make a commitment to offer $30 low income uh, broadband offerings so that if you qualified for ACP, you could basically get broadband for free. Um, so it was very, very successful. And um, uh, as I said, unfortunately, back in May, uh, Congress did not renew the money for it. So I'm going to go a little bit off script. Um, Chris has provided me good questions for this because he is really the expert up here. Um, I'm going to go a little bit off script, though, and ask you, because you use the term broadband a lot, but yeah. I feel like um, my mother, for instance, has never and likely will never have broadband where she lives. Um, and I'm wondering if the if there really was a distinction between broadband um, or the fact that the title of it is connectivity, if it was any potential um, internet or, or high-speed internet even. Yeah, actually, uh, there were definitions that uh, uh, were required to uh, uh, qualify for the program. Um, so the FCC actually, uh, over the last few years, uh, has been pushed to set standards for what qualifies as uh, broadband or high-speed broadband because all of the programs that fund broadband, you know, the, the programs that uh, help subsidize building out broadband, they all uh, work to these uh, standards. Uh, the, the typical one these days is based on speed. Um, it's usually uh, um, 100 megabytes down uh, and 10 megs up, although we're trying to get them to do it symmetrical because of all the video conferencing that people are doing. Uh, but um, uh, so that's the standard. And that was important because you saw in some communities uh, they would not build out uh, broadband to neighborhoods uh, that are low income. Uh, building the subsidy uh, helped give confidence to uh, broadband providers, internet you know, uh, service providers we're talking about, um, that uh, that they could get customers in these neighborhoods. Uh, and we want them to build out to everybody. So it's an important part of their financial equation. But yeah, it's a speed standard. And, um, and that's important to get people connected to the types of uses that are becoming so important in everyday life for people uh, over the internet, uh, as opposed to some of the older programs that were about connectivity, but uh, they were created really for the phone system. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Lifeline program, that was really created in the 80s under Ronald Reagan to connect everyone to phones. Um, broadband has a higher standard. Um, so we want to talk about who it helps, because what we've determined is maybe not people who um, only have access to, to slower Internet, although we want to get them access to faster Internet, if that's at all possible. Um, fingers crossed. Uh, when it comes to real impact in people's lives, um, what are the two are the type of people um, who may be most benefited from the ACP? And it sounds like we're thinking about both directly benefited by getting the subsidy and maybe there are indirect benefits as well. Yeah, the direct benefit, uh, you know, number one, you think of people who didn't have broadband and um, are trying to connect to it, uh, uh, are trying to figure out what uh, uh, what it means to have broadband in their life and all the things that come with all the benefits like banking and education and entrepreneurship and jobs that come with being connected. But uh, we also found that there are a lot of folks who um, uh, my colleague uh, at the Benton Institute uh, uh, wrote about uh, the 
coined the term uh, subscription vulnerable. These are folks who are making tough choices in their budget every day. And maybe they had broadband, but there are some months where they cancel their subscription. Uh, maybe they're gaming, uh, you know, a, a low rate that you can get to sign up. But it's because their budgets are tight and they're making choices between whether they have connectivity in their home uh, or whether, uh, you know, they're paying for something for their kids or for food or for, you know, these are, these are tough choices and tough times, especially with inflation. Um, and so the folks who are subscription vulnerable who might have to end their subscription and come back two months later, this program really benefited. Um, there were 20, over 20 million people who signed up for the ACP. Um, and, uh, uh, and they were in all types of communities, ur urban and rural. You find low-income people everywhere. Uh, sometimes people, when they think of broadband policy, they think of uh, low-income subsidies as an urban problem where build out to other communities is a rural problem. Believe me, there are plenty of low-income folks in rural areas that needed this. Um, uh, some of the most disconnected areas are actually tribal areas. And uh, this program actually had a higher uh, low-income uh, uh, subsidy for tribal areas. Um, that was $70 if you live uh, in a tribal community instead of the $30 because it costs so much to build out. So when you think of the um, uh, indirect benefits of helping broadband providers bring broadband to places where they need a return on investment, need to know they can get subscribers, um, the $70 subsidy in tribal areas is incredibly important because many of those communities are more remote and uh, uh, you need that level of subsidy to help uh, get that return on investment in rural and remote areas. And I'm I'm not imagining that once they have built something out, they're not unbuilding it now that the subsidy is gone. That's right. Yeah. When when ISPs build out networks, they're thinking about can they recoup their return on investment over long periods of time. Uh, you know, we're talking thirty. 40, 50 years. Uh, there's arguments about how many decades it should be, um, but but it's it's decades. Um, and so, yeah, once you build out that infrastructure, especially if it's uh, fiber in the ground that can be upgraded much more easily than old copper lines, um, that is in there for good. And then it's really just about um, you know recouping that uh, the return on investment over time um, and trying to give a fair and equitable uh, subscription price to the consumer. Wonderful. So we have our first question. Go ahead. Yeah, I was curious if you've had any uh, observations of companies that have stopped building out or are now questioning whether they continue their build outs. We've had a lot of rural broadband expansion here in Georgia, mm -hmm. especially, right? And and I know a lot of companies that are currently actively in their rollouts. I'm curious if there's been any observations from anyone that's like, hey, we don't have this subsidy anymore. We know we can get subscribers, but we needed that subsidy to justify us going over there, right? Yeah, it, you know, it remains to be seen. I, I don't think we we have enough time yet since the subsidy ran out at the end of May. It's been 94 days since somebody ran out. And if you want to keep track of it, uh, we have a, a, on our blog post um, that we posted a week ago at publicknowledge.org, uh, you can see we have a counter that updates every time you refresh. Uh, so it's up to 94 days. but. Uh, we haven't really studied uh, yet the full impact on the companies. What we do know is that uh, when this passed, uh, in uh, the ACP was in the infrastructure bill uh, that passed on a bipartisan basis. Uh, money for uh, what was called the BEAD program, and I'm not going to remember the acronym for the BEAD program, but it was the broadband program in the infrastructure package that gave money for building out infra broadband infrastructure. And that's just starting to be given out um, this year into early next year. They're going to start giving that money out. Um, uh, but the plans that companies put into the states to try and receive those subsidies, uh, most of those probably included uh, an assumption that there would be an ACP to support low-income folks. So um, so the, these this has been a year in the making of like, Companies figuring out how to apply for this money. It's being funneled through state broadband offices that were created over a year ago uh, in order to uh, receive the federal dollars and give it out. Um, and so our hope is that they're continuing with this, this plan and that we can get it renewed. Um, the BEAD money and the ACP money were consensus uh, 
pieces of legislation. Uh, I work at Public Knowledge. We fight broadband providers on issues like net neutrality every day. But we worked hand in glove with them to get the ACP program, to get the bead money. We all agreed on this. Um, and so they're working with us hand in glove to try to get it restored. Uh, there's very few folks who are opposed to it. And so they're uh, not only working with us to get it restored, but they're hoping that uh, we can get some sort of subsidy back in so they can count it for the long term. That's customers for them. They don't want to give up on this. Um, so we'll see if any smaller ones can't make it, but certainly the biggest players, um, you know, in this 94 day and growing period, um, uh, they remain committed to the program. And at least that's what they're telling me uh, when we sit with them every week and talk strategy about how can we get this program restored. Um, so just to fill in, the BEAD program is the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program with $42.45 billion. And if anybody is writing this down, it is at broadbandusa.ntia.doc.gov. And DOC is Department of Commerce. Um, I also want to th throw out quickly, qualitatively, just to support what you said. Um, I live in a community, I moved there two years ago, that was supposed to be getting um fiber rollout it was supposed to be getting it in 2022 um and then 2023 um and now 2020 something um we were also supposed to be getting monthly updates on it um it is still being rolled out but in terms of chris saying it's only been 90 days so we don't know the impact on if things are stalling or not i think some of these programs are taking so much longer than what they had been imagined to take that it's going to be very hard to tell, is this just a delay or is this a pause because the program is gone, um, given just the delays we've already seen. Okay, a couple of things that come to mind. First off, has anybody done a comparison of this program with rural electrification? Oh, say it in the mic. oh they asked you to say it in the mic, yeah. Has anybody done a comparison of this with the rural electrification program? Back in the 1940s, that was a program much larger than this one. Yeah. And had much more impact. And it's generally considered to be a big success. Oh. So a comparison between the two programs would, I think, be very much ammunition. The second thing that I would point out is that the current emphasis on running cables is perhaps not the best idea. Cat5 broadband participation can get a lot less infrastructure. Uh, for example, so there are some countries that never had a wired telephone system that have gone directly to cell. So the concept that, okay, we're focused so much on getting wires or fiber, uh, fiber run from building to building. When I was an Eagles Boy Scout in 19, I want to say 58, 59, I saw some of the first uh, fibers at IIT. Uh, that's an old technology, guys. And focusing on fiber to the exclusion of getting the service out is perhaps not the best use of our technology. But if you could say that, OK, rural electrification had this kind of impact, this can have the same kind of impact, that would be a hard thing to argue against. Yeah, these are great points. So let me talk about each of them. Um, no one has done a, that I know of. I, I have not seen a, a, a very close study or comparison to rural electrification, but the arguments, it gets brought up all the time in the policy discussion because people view this as, uh, uh, this is our generation's rural electrification project, basically, um, because of the economic impact that rural electrification had on communities, big, small, everything in between. Um, that broadband deployment can have uh, a similar, uh, and we hope even greater impact on those communities. So the, the scope, the fact that you have to get infrastructure out to anyone and everyone, um, that we want, you know, 99.99% uh, uh, connectivity in the same way we have with electrification, the same way we got with phone uh, when phones uh, got deployed as well. Um, that that is the ultimate goal um, for 
for infrastructure build out. Um, and of course, the, the subsidy for low income folks is a part of making that more economical. So, so that I think the comparison is real. Um, when it comes to what type of infrastructure, is it fiber? Uh, is it wireless? Um, uh, folks will differ, but I, I'll give you my opinion. I believe that the fiber build out is actually really smart long term investments. Why? Because um, any cellular network um, works because those cell towers go back to the ground and connect to a fiber backbone. That's just how broadband networks work. So if, even if you're connecting wirelessly, you're using fiber. And so the benefit of fiber over wireless uh, services right now um, is that uh, you're bringing more bandwidth as far out into the network as possible. Um, and so again, if these are long-term investments, you want to build out as much of that with fiber as you can. Yes, it is more expensive. And so you want to take advantage of these subsidies to do as much of that as possible, which is why I think uh, the fiber requirements or the preferences, I should say, for the fiber in the infrastructure dollars, I think is really smart. Uh, it lowers the cost for folks who want to build uh, wireless networks um, to build them out because then they have, it's easier for them to connect back to the broader network. Um, uh, there are other uh, types of connectivity. Uh, you know, satellite is one that is interesting, and people are trying to see if it can compete with fiber. Um, right now, the cost is a bit more, uh, but the quality is getting better. When you look at low Earth orbit satellite, this is a uh, um, like Starlink from Elon Musk. Uh, I know he's he's controversial in some categories, but when it comes to broadband, he's probably got the best satellite broadband service out there. Um, it's a little bit more expensive. Uh, but the quality of it has gotten much better than old school satellite broadband. So, uh, you know, you got to pick the best that you can to get to the re most remote areas. It's probably going to be in the long run all of the above types of technologies. Uh, but the more fiber you build out, the easier it is long term. And I will say with a, a nearby county that has finished their, their broadband rollout um, to mine, they categorized it by here are the places we're going to do actual fiber rollout. Here are the places we're going to preference wireless rollout because we can't get fiber there. They really did a mix and match to try to figure out what can we do for whatever households there are to make sure they're all connected to some high speed. Yeah. And also, uh, fiber can promote competition in the long run uh, because of how it lowers the cost for others to then connect to the, your network. So, uh, for example, I live in a relatively urban area, Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, but up until this year, we had one high-speed broadband provider. Um, and it took our community building out a fiber backbone. To, uh, we built it out to all of our schools and our government uh, uh, buildings, which gets you a pretty good you know, spread out footprint among our community so that we could lower the cost for someone to come in and compete with Comcast in our community. And so now Ting has come in and they're competing with Comcast. That can make prices lower for consumers. So there's a benefit to uh, doing the long-term investment of building out fiber, even if you might end up getting a fixed wireless service in the long run. Hi. Um, yeah, not just uh, building out the fiber itself, but I think municipal broadband may, may be the way to go. And uh, actually, I used to work in wireless telecommunications, yeah. both at uh, PacPill Wireless and at T-Mobile and a variety of contracts with other companies. So, um, but one, one thing I've heard and kind of seen is that a lot of times the corporations would not uh, want to go and, like you said, build out in rural areas but they also fought, fight tooth and nail to keep, you know, municipal uh, from being there. But um, I know this is a common, you know, commonly used uh, uh, solution, but I, I think it might be an idea to just have, a, at least temporarily, to have an executive order saying this is legal, you know, that, you know, municipal broadband is legal, stop all these lawsuits and everything at the you know, state and everything level, state at the federal level is legal. So, you know, and like uh, the state of Maine has actually been trying to do it, but they've okay. been fighting them tooth and nail on it. So it, it's really something that uh, we need. And, and like you were saying, it shouldn't just be 
fiber. It should also it also needs to be some wireless because yes, like you said, it goes down and it comes back up to the you know fiber, but you can't you know it's too expensive to run fiber everywhere, and sometimes you just really can't do it, especially in rural areas. You know. Yeah, Muni broadband uh, has been mini broadband projects and they can be anything from a community buying and literally selling direct to the customer mm -hmm. or it can be tax incentives uh to build out in a neighborhood it could be the fiber backbone thing that my community did it can be there's lots of ways you can build out municipal broadband uh you don't have to be in the business of offering it to the consumers but uh there are some states who have banned it yeah. um uh, and the state legislature, largely where ISPs have gotten, ISP lobbyists have gotten a hold of state legislators, uh, where there aren't a lot of us public interest advocates there. And they've gotten uh, states to pass uh, uh, restrictions on building municipal uh, uh, broadband projects, uh, which is unfortunate because when they don't want to serve certain communities, either municipal projects or often a small co op or uh, uh, really small providers are the only ones who will go in and serve those small communities. Uh, but I think they're afraid of the competition. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, I think it should be treated like he was talking about rural electrification. It should be treated as necessary infrastructure because yeah. it is now. Someone say, someone say it should be treated as a utility. Yeah, as a utility. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, because we have a really long is. way to go to win that fight, unfortunately. Uh, uh, the FCC has been going back and forth on whether or not broadband should be treated as a utility. Uh, but we continue to fight that fight. I agree. And I think part of the problem is the people that get put into the FCC. That needs to be people who, well, that's another argument, agree with that. You know, it's when you put people in there, you need to make sure somebody who agrees with that because that's, yeah, instead of somebody who has had corporate ties, you know. You know, it's interesting on that. Um, I don't do this area of policy work anymore, but um, I, I come from a very, 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 very rural area mm -hmm. in Florida. Um, and I would be in conversations with folks talking about rural connectivity and broadband in DC, and not one of them in the whole conversation had ever experienced not having high speed internet in the days when high speed internet was widely available. Mm -hmm. um, they had always had access to it in some way. And we don't have a lot of people who have had to live that life day to day in these fights from, from the government perspective, from the policy perspective, able to talk truthfully about what it means to go down to. And sometimes in DC, they'll say Starbucks. We didn't, did not have, do not have a Starbucks in our community. That was way too rich for us. So we went down to McDonald's um, or whatever hotel was available to be able to use the Wi-Fi when we needed it. Um, and and so I think that would be an interesting thing to talk about is just how do we diversify the policy space so that more of these people with this experience are in the conversation? Yeah, not enough poor people are, are getting elected to Congress these days. Uh, but this is why the pandemic was such a pivot point because maybe they're not poor, but uh, during the pandemic, maybe their kid was going to school with some of those poor. I mean, they heard the stories and, and that really was the opportunity that allowed us to get this first time ever low income subsidy program with the ACP. Yeah, and it seems nowadays that they don't, and politics don't even talk about, we're gonna do this for poor people. It's like, we need to build up the middle class, but yeah, poor people need help too, more than the middle class does, you know, but that gets left entirely out. Yeah. Um, so why don't we, we talk a little bit about, because um, some of you had heard about the ACP, but there's another program that has been around a lot longer called the Universal Service Fund. Has anybody heard of the Universal Service Fund? If you've, if you've read your cell phone bill, you might have heard about it because you, you'll see a, a little thing that says USF um, at the bottom of your cell phone bill. It's a, it's a little one of those surcharges that, that comes on. Um, and some people have said this might be a replacement for ACP now that it's gone away. Chris, can you talk about the Universal Service Fund maybe a little bit, how it fits into this picture? Yeah. Well, yeah. So during the fight over the last year to try to uh, put more money into the ACP program, as we, we said, it ran out of money in May. Um, and when that happened, 
Uh, we had been fighting for months, like I said, side by side with industry players to try to get the Congress to refund the program. Uh, it costs probably about $7 billion a year uh, uh, to have a full year of ACP funding. Um, but uh, a lot of members of Congress said, look, are you guys, industry players, public interest groups, are you going to keep coming to us every year asking us to renew this money? And we said, yes, until you create a long-term uh, subsidy. Um, uh, there are three major drivers of the digital divide. I mentioned the number one, uh, one is uh, whether it's affordable. Uh, the number two one is, is uh, do you actually have access to, you know, this is the infrastructure problem. Have, have they built out to where you live? Is it accessible and then the third one is people who just don't aren't sure uh if broadband is relevant in their lives uh maybe they don't have the digital literacy skills uh uh that if they get broadband to make the most of it and so there's a growing field of we call the digital equity field of people who work in communities help people get devices sign up for broadband do digital literacy training classes but these are kind of the three major drivers of people will describe it as the adoption problem like you know you can afford it you have it, but did you adopt it? Did you sign up? Um, the Universal Service Program uh, can uh, and has over the years addressed all three drivers of the digital divide when it comes to phones. Phones were the essential communications uh, network of the 20th century. Broadband, whether it's your device, uh, which because all your telephony is now going over broadband networks. That, that, that's all changing. Um, uh, but uh, folks said, well, why don't we make the universal service program the long-term solution for all of those three drivers of the digital divide? Um, most importantly, the affordability one. Um, so there's great discussion in Congress about, hey, can we reform the universal service fund? Uh, it's also run out of the FCC. And uh, uh, what would it take to do it? Um, Problem is, there's a lot of hard decisions for policymakers to make that happen. Uh, they've got to restructure where the money comes from. Right now, they take that uh, uh, fee on your phone bill and they fund the entire USF program, which is like $8 billion um, a year in funding, which goes to building out phone networks, goes to a low income subsidy that's much smaller. It's like $9.25, not enough for broadband. Um, it also funds, if you've ever heard of the E-rate program, this is a program that gives money to schools and libraries to build out uh, telecommunications in uh, their buildings. Um, so the idea was, well, if we reform this, we have to reform how it's funded. Um, and so there's great debate on how you do that right now. But in the long run, everyone wants it to have a low-income subsidy that looks like the ACP. Um, so there's been this question of, can we get Congress to renew the ACP for another year while they work out the politics of USF reform. Um, we, what we know is that uh, the last two chairs of the FCC, uh, Republican and Democratic chairs, both felt like they did not have the authority to reform the USF fund without uh, Congress giving them the authority to do it. Uh, I would uh, respectfully disagree, but since we can't convince them to do it, uh, and because there's money involved that has to be reworked, uh, we really need Congress to act to make this long-term solution. Um, so we're working both problems at the same time. Um, there's literally a USF working group, bipartisan working group in the Senate right now uh, that we're waiting. Uh, we've been waiting for a few months now for them to put out their proposal. Uh, uh, Senator Thune from South Dakota and Senator Lujan from New Mexico, Re Republican and Democrat, are the two co-chairs of this working group. And they have other colleagues working with them trying to come up with a solution for a long-term subsidy. Um, I would prefer it to work uh, with some sort of small fee like we have right now with USF. Um, uh, you could build in some money from other parts of the internet ecosystem if you wanted to. But I would like to keep it out of the appro annual appropriations debate and processes because we've learned our lesson from the ACP that when we have to go back every year and ask Congress to put it in their budget, uh, that that's a lot of time and effort that uh, none of us really want to do. We want something that sustains itself over mm -hmm. time. I ha actually have a theory about um, sunsets in yeah. Congress because we, we see sunsets on a lot of different pieces of legislation. Um, and most notably in, in my history, we see it on um, amendments to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> which has sunsets. Um, and in, in my experience, sunsets work best when the sunset impacts the person with the highest political power. So when somebody, for instance, maybe the National Security Agency, national security interests, very well-funded agency, um, are the ones negatively impacted by the law going away, they have incredibly high numbers of resources to come in and try to get that renewed. Whereas when the sunset impacts maybe low-income internet users, yeah. um, they might not have the resources to come in and, and renew a sunset when it goes away. Um, is that argument, or are there any other arguments coming up? As you said, there might be a temporary extension for a year. That'd be great. Are, yeah. are we trying to, you said the goal is permanent, but are we seeing it maybe become one of these like frequently sunset laws that you do have to fight over and over again? I mean, we would take that as a like a, a less bad situation than not having the subsidy. Uh, but uh, in the long run, a long term, so yes, we would take that. Like there's a bill right now that they could pass. Uh, it's the Affordable Connectivity Program Extension Act. It's got bipartisan support. Actually, the the Senate, uh, one of the, the Republican Senate sponsors, uh, Senator Vance, is running for vice president. Like he's the biggest Republican champion for this, um, and he should be because the state of Ohio has a lot of people who qualify for ACP. Um, uh, but yeah, twenty three million dollars a day is being lost by consumers to uh, to this program every day that we don't have it. So. Uh, a sunset, you know, renewal until we come up with a long-term solution would be fine. It wouldn't be a perfect solution, uh, but we would take it. It would help people. Um, I think the long-term solution is needed so that um, uh, you have reliability for folks who are in the program. You have people who are signed up for this, over 20 million people signed up, and now they had to figure out what uh, they can afford and what they're doing uh, with their subscription with their broadband provider. You also have the broadband providers, um, since they're factoring into uh, the, their revenue model, uh, trying to figure out will it be there in the long run, will it not, and they have to make the decisions that you asked about. So um, long-term sustainability is important, but um, an annual renewal would at least get us there while Congress does what Congress does when they try to work through uh, hard political uh, situations. Uh, as actually, this one's not that hard. I'm kidding. But no one opposes it. Well, there's a few members of Congress who oppose this. Somebody always opposes it. Yeah, I, I won't name names, but there's a couple key people. You want me to name names? You yes. all want him to name names. Okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 the ranking Republican uh, uh, on the Senate Commerce Committee is Ted Cruz. He does not like this program. Um, uh, but he has lots of his Republican colleagues who who do want it. I, I mentioned Senator Vance and uh, Senator Wicker from uh, uh, Mississippi and so many others um, who are trying to tweak and fix some uh, issues with the program. Uh, maybe they don't want it to be as much as big a subsidy. So they, I think some of them want it to come down from 200% of poverty to like 150 or 125% of poverty. But they want to have the subsidy. And they're trying to figure out how to do it in what they would say is the most fiscally responsible way. Um, so before we um, wrap this panel, I'm going to ask some questions about what you all can do. But before I do that, we have a question. Um, if you'll forgive me, I just want to offer a little bit of testimony. Mr. Lewis, none of what I say will be news to you for sure, but I just want to share it. Um, my sister is a direct um, beneficiary of this program when it existed, and my mother as well at the time. And... Uh, when she left her abusive husband and moved into her own space, having that um, uh, affordable internet access allowed her children to educate themselves when there were days that they had to stay home from school, because of course, when you had COVID breakouts, even after going back, you had to stay home. It allowed her to find um, employment by doing her own research. She has a disabled child. It allowed her to educate herself and find resources yes. for her disabled child to improve his life. Your time. That's real. People don't understand. It's very real. And yeah. while I'm in a much different um, income packet from her, just being able to see firsthand how it affects people, I just can't understand how um, people can't support this. So I'm so glad to hear that there is so much support for this in Congress. And so my question after all of this testimony is to say, 
does your organization or any other organization that you know of have advocacy tools that we as individuals can use to help um, fight the good fight and put pressure on our own elected officials who can then put pr pressure on their colleagues who are in these um, these groups? Yeah, if you go to publicknowledge.org, we have an action on our action page right now where you can contact your member of Congress and uh, express and demand uh, that you want uh, the, the ACP renewed. Um, you don't have to go through us. You can call them yourself if you know how to reach them. But they need to continue to hear from folks. Um, uh, I think they know that they messed up. Um, we hear constant discussion of, oh, next time we have a bill that has to pass through, maybe we can attach it um, to it. Um, you have a few Republicans who want to support it, but they're looking for, as they say in uh, D.C., a pay for. Uh, they don't want to go further into debt. That's very ideologically important for the Republican Party. And so uh, there's different discussions on what those pay fors could be. Uh, but with certain bills that are moving, there might be pay fors in the bill that they could use. So um, so we're looking for a vehicle attached to, but they need to keep hearing from people. So please, yeah, go to our website or just contact and reach out to them yourself. Um, but uh, they need to keep hearing from folks. Um, your your story is uh, one that rings very true to me. Um, uh, Amy knows that in a former life, I was a, a, a local school board member. And uh, if you don't have kids, uh, publicknowledge.org, go to our uh, action page, knowledge.org. Um, uh, people don't understand that you know, even though we're out of the pandemic, students with disabilities, um, often low-income students who show up to school with lower reading skills, that the ability to pre-teach and reteach topics uh, outside of the core classroom time is so important for their academic success uh, that they need those supports and additional tools. And many of them are online these days. Um, and parents of students with disabilities are very aggressive in finding the res those resources online. Yeah, are you? Yeah, yeah. I miss I misspell knowledge all the time. <laughs> but thank you for your thank you for your story. Um, I know there's a lot of other folks who are living that. I'm not ashamed. <laughs> Um, okay, so I said we were going to talk about what people could do. You yeah. gave a lot of those. You talked about your website, which I can spell. Okay. Um, you've talked about contacting um, members. We have um, not only a live bill, but FCC members who may or may not be um, convinced that they can readopt programs that you've talked about. So we have Congress as a lever. We have the FCC as a lever. Um, and we also I really have say Congress is the most important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the long term universal service fund or whatever they call it in the future long term solution is will not be successful if it doesn't have the political sort of support from Congress. So, okay. yeah, they're really in the driver's seat right now. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also the courts. And oh, so yeah. you talked about USF a little bit. Um, it's under threat in the courts right now, right? It is. There, there's multiple lawsuits to try to make, uh, and this, this comes from folks who, if, if uh, I think I saw a panel a couple of days ago, people were talking about uh, Chevron deference to independent agencies being revoked. This is the deference that the court gives to expert agencies like the FCC to take a broad statute mandate and make decisions about the details of regulations. Um, and that's being challenged in court. But the Universal Service Program uh, is also being challenged from another angle um, of can agencies, uh, if they're told by Congress to create a program uh, and assess a fee, are they allowed to administer that fee and assess that fee and change it over time? Uh, people consider that uh, to look like a tax, some folks who oppose these sorts of programs. And so they're suing right now in the court, and uh, they've sued in multiple uh, districts. And there's one district that actually, uh, for the first time after multiple wins, uh, the FCC lost. And so there might be a circuit split going to the Supreme Court saying, are agencies allowed to assess these, these sorts of fees to run these programs? Is it legal? Is it constitutional to have an 
uh, an FCC, and uh, there's another organization called USAC, the Universal Service Administration Maybe. Committee. Yeah. Um, and they they really administer the fees. They collect the money, and they dole out the money, all with the supervision of the FCC. Uh, but there are folks who are very concerned about uh, having agencies do this sort of work uh, without any really check from Congress. I think there's oversight from the Congress all the time, uh, but that's why you see these sorts of lawsuits. So Congress, again, reaffirming that they want this in the long run is important, uh, but also having an agency empowered to run these programs is incredibly important as well, and so that's under threat in the courts. So sometimes with um, legal actions, you'll see what are, what are known as amicus curiae, briefs filed, um, which is a fancy Latin word that I likely just mispronounced. That means friend of the court, which I know I can pronounce properly. Um, and and they're, they're non-party briefs that support one of the party's sides and normally provide additional arguments. Um, do, would you know of any organization, if people are impacted by this, who might be looking to file something on behalf of the impacted individuals themselves and something people could sign on to? Yeah, I mean, public knowledge certainly is filing in these court cases. So um, we, uh, uh, there are others um, uh, who are filing in the USF. Uh, it's us, uh, often the Benton Institute, um, who's phenomenal. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, I think we're the, the, the main ones. Uh, sometimes we'll file in partnership uh, with like the AARP and uh, AARP has tremendous support for, uh, for these programs because uh, on a, honestly, it's often folks on fixed income who are retired, uh, who are hurt the most uh, by these subsidies going away. I do have a question. You, you mentioned Ted and I was like, okay, interesting idea. Most of the time, we all think a certain way. Oh, we're all stuck in our certain way. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, huh? I thought, how can we help Republicans to act favorably on something if we if we help them in a way that they're able to do what we want, right? So, uh, and you just thought of that. I was like, this guy might actually have some ideas on that as a policy guy. So, nothing, could you elaborate on that, maybe? Yeah, nothing. Nothing beats folks saying, "I'm from your state." or I'm from your district, and and I care about this program. I mean, there's a reason why it was a bipartisan move to create the ACP in 2021, because during the pandemic, folks in every district in the country were saying, oh my gosh, someone in my community, someone in my family, or, or my house is not connected, and this is incredibly important. Um, uh, like I said, uh, Senator J.D. Vance is the leader Republican sponsor on this because the numbers in Ohio are probably the most stark. You, Senator J.D. Vance, he's running for vice president, is the lead co-sponsor of the affordable of the ACP Extension Act in the Senate because if you look at the numbers in the state of Ohio, I mean, he's just looking out for a state. Um, there is the highest percentage of folks who qualify for the ACP. Um, and and a number of others uh, in both parties support this. So while there's a few uh, folks who, out of uh, I think stubbornness or adherence to ideology, um, many of them on the right, um, there's a handful who oppose this program. It's broadly popular. Yeah, but they need to keep hearing from folks. They need to know that folks want it, um, and so that when they look for ways to save some money and cut back on the program, they don't cut back on the ones that are most important people. Uh, like, you know, uh, uh, right now, if they uh, shrink the program, the, the thing with the biggest target on their back are uh, students uh, who qualify for uh, free and reduced lunch. Um, but that's because there are some whole schools that are labeled as free and reduced lunch schools and because they're giving school systems, local school systems have started to give free lunch to everybody. And they don't want every student to be able to get ACP. They just want the low-income kids to get ACP. So there might be some tweaks like that to the program uh, if they renew it. But you want to make sure they don't cut out things that are really, really important, like the benefit for veterans or the benefit for if you're from a state with high tribal population. These are some of the most disconnected folks. So I'm going to ask you probably... Um the question that most policy people loathe, or at least the people 
that I work with at my organization. Okay. Um, and I'm giving you, you a warning. I, I know, I know, but I'm going to. Okay. <laughs> um, which is, so there, it's September 1st. Mm -hmm. We're in the, the last third of 2024. There are many priorities right now competing for congressional attention, um, including I'm hearing there might be some large election coming up in, in just a couple months. November 5th. So a couple months in a few days. Um, what if you had to put a number on it? Um, are the odds that you think this will get serious attention um, and could lead to passing? Um, and I'm going to ask you a, a follow-up immediately, which is if we drive up the amount of phone calls that are going into Congress, how could that number change? Um, I'm not seeing enough urgency out of members of Congress right now. Um, uh, and to add to it, there are folks who want to skip the short-term renewal and want to solve the long-term problem so they don't have to listen to advocates like me every year. Um, and so they're willing to go without until they solve the long-term problem. Um, so an outright renewal and get the program back right now, I think it's low likelihood. I think we're talking 15, 20% likely. Um, an outpouring of support and demanding that uh, this program is restored until there's a long-term solution uh, could drastically improve that. Um, uh, but right now, a lot of the debate is how do they create a long-term program rather than taking care of the folks who are, like I said, losing $23 million a day yeah. in subsidies. Um, so thinking through that, there are a lot of people right now without um, who are struggling. Is there anything that those people can do, anything that they might have access to in the interim um, until we, we might either get a short or, or long term? But maybe what I'm hearing is hopefully a short term solution um, on ACP. Yeah, um, I think, you know, we already talked about activism. You certainly go to publicknowledge.org um, uh, to take action. But uh, those folks also, um, there's a great organization, I know the national organization, but they have affiliates in almost every state. And they're the leaders of what I called earlier this digital equity movement. Their affiliates are literally in communities everywhere, helping people get connected to broadband. Um, if you went to, um, uh, uh, they're called the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, uh, NDIA, National Digital Inclusion Alliance, I think their website is um, uh, netinclusion.org is my best guess. Um, it might be digitalinclusion.org. Digital. It's digitalinclusion.org. But looking them up and finding your nearest affiliate, um, if you're low income or if you have a friend or family or neighbor who is low income, um, and connecting with their affiliate, they're great at working with folks um, to talk to the local broadband providers. Find out, you know, many of the broadband providers, even though the ACP has gone away, have made some commitments to offer low come low. Um, uh, low cost offerings that are still like $30 a month, even though we don't have the match from the federal government. Um, so working with those folks um, to uh, figure out what options are available. Um, some states have um, some Band-Aid subsidies uh, that you've seen, some states, states that have money uh, put that into their state budgets. Um, but since I work at the federal level, I don't know which states do and which states don't. The local affiliates at NDIA have the toolkits to know if if they can help you find those opportunities. So while we fight this fight, yes, please contact Congress, but you can help people as well by uh, going to those resources at uh, digitalinclusion.org and finding those local affiliates. So we're in our last um, three and a half minutes. We've talked a lot through different aspects of, aspects of this program, um, ways it's being challenged, different levers that could or could not be pulled. Um, what haven't we talked about? Well, how would you want to spend your last three minutes and what are the last messages you might want to leave um, the folks here, the folks watching the video um, with to conclude the panel? Uh, you know, let me go back to what my, my friend over here um, said about broadband being a utility. Um, unfortunately, uh, that concept is not popular in Washington. It's popular everywhere else. Um, and so it's really important that beyond the low-income subsidy with ACP, 
um, beyond the infrastructure build out that we have an agency, uh, the Federal Communications Commission, that has the authority to look at consumer issues over broadband. Um, because even if we build out everywhere, um, we need to be looking at if, pe if people are being price gouged by their broadband providers. We need uh, uh, an agency on the beat deciding if there's competition in the marketplace or if other things need to be done. Um, we need people talking about the reliability of the network. Uh, what happens when a storm hits and what mandates are there uh, if a natural disaster knocks out your network? Um, all these things are currently um, under the FCC's jurisdiction when it comes to phone networks, but not for broadband networks. Um, or at least it's being debated whether they should be actually. Uh, technically, they in April, the FCC restored it, but depending on who gets elected, that sometimes turns off or on uh, based on uh, the administration. So um, we need that resolved, and that's something that you should be telling your members of Congress that you want. I mean, make it as simple as, you know, uh, member of Congress, I want you to let the FCC treat broadband like a utility. Um, and then figure the agency can figure out what that means. Um, but we need that sort of mindset, that sort of protection. Uh, otherwise, uh, people get left out. Uh, people have their service be low quality or be unreliable. Um, uh, small things that may not impact you, but might impact your neighbor, like um, uh, accessibility rights uh, for folks who are disabled um, or small businesses. Uh, being able to connect to the network, um, alarm systems, which are very important for folks with medical alerts or or just who care about having uh, alarms in their home. Uh, these things all run over the network and we take for granted that they work until all of a sudden we don't have an agency making sure that they work. Um, and so treating broadband like utility is really a long-term goal we need to resolve. Thank you, Chris. Um, I don't know if anybody um, saw when they came into this room that the um, room across the hall had a big line, which means in about 20 seconds when that panel ends, there's going to be a lot of loudness. I'm going to ask a lot from you all right now uh, because this is my last panel, and I'm going to ask for you not only to cheer for Chris, but to cheer for the amazing volunteers in the room that have been making all of these sessions possible. And this is my last opportunity to get you all to be as loud or louder than the full room across the hall. So we're all going to do on the count of three, you, we're Scott. just gonna cheer for everybody up here. Ready? One, two, go. <laughs> Scott, thanks for having a, a panel on ACP. I know there's all sorts of topics we cover, but uh, uh, it might not be the most logical one, but it's so important for everyone who wants to be connected to all the great content that's here. So thanks. Thank you. about board like activism on the board right there. It's on the sign. Oh, is it? Yeah. I can't see the sign. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. And we have this teeny tiny language on the back of our name tags that is telling me I need to, as a final thing, ask you to rate this panel. Um, tell Dragon Con how wonderful Chris Lewis is, how much you liked hearing about this topic. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, and have a lovely, lovely night. Thank you. <laughs>